All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's been a long three days of partying and socialing and listening, and everyone's a little tired, so I really appreciate you all coming out. Um, my name is Ashton Kimmerling. Um, you can reach me on Twitter at, Ash at Ashton, and uh, this is generative integration testing. Um, before starting, I'd like to thank people. Um, if I, I wouldn't be here for, if it weren't for certain people, one of which is my wife, Leah. We got married uh, two weeks ago, uh, which, thank you. Um, which you might recognize as being a little close to a conference where you're intending on speaking. So she was very, very supportive and uh, understanding of me working on this, coming up to our own wedding, and very, very firm about not working during our honeymoon. Um, I'm very thankful of that. Also the CONJ organizers, um, especially in particular Lynn Grogan, who dealt with my inability to do things on time and spell. Russ Olson, who helped me um, make this presentation not suck and Alex for guiding me around and getting me in the right place, and a myriad of other people who I, whose names I don't know, and countless open source contributors. We all depend on open source code that people have given freely out of their love for the craft, and if it weren't for that, we wouldn't be here. So um, I work for Pivotal Tracker. I work at Pivotal Labs, but I work on the Pivotal Tracker team dedicated. Um, who here has used Pivotal Tracker? Oh, excellent, a really good number. So, it's, a, it's an agile product management tool. Um, there's columns of stories that you can drag them around and manipulate them. And keep that in mind when we're discussing how we're doing tests, because that form really makes, um, really decides what kind of tests we can do and decides what kind of failures we have in a large JavaScript application. Um, I'm particularly interested in making software more reliable. How do we make it do what we think it's going to do? Um, and I've come to the informal opinion there's two ways to do that. Either we have a software that is simpler and easier to understand such that a human can look at it and intuitively understand where it's attempting to go, and tests, both um, compiler style and unit style. Um, there's a lot of speakers here, though, who dedicate themselves to making the former easier. So let's take a look at the latter. Um, who here uses TDD? Ah, good number. Who here doesn't use TDD, but actually still has a very good unit and integration test suite? The other half of the room. That's good. That's good. Um, and who here has pushed a bug to prod in the last mm, month or so? Yeah, either you know or your hands, you know. Otherwise, you put, if you know your hands up, otherwise you don't know about that bug yet. So um, Pivotal Tracker and Pivotal Labs in general is very opinionated about TDD and about pairing. Um, here's some stats from our, our particular application. Um, I think among non-financial, non-safety critical systems, it's pretty good, um, especially having three people who are dedicated to hunting down bugs and regression testing in an environment where we only have 10 engineers, give or take. Um, that's, a really, that's a surprisingly high ratio. And yet we still push bugs to prod. Um, why is that? Um, I'm, I'm down to the opinion that it's time and creativity. Nobody has enough time to write all the tests they want, um, and everyone knows that. You never have enough time. And it also comes down to creativity. Good tests are hard to write, and often you don't know when you're running short on creativity, or if you, even if you do know, you don't know how to fix it. Um, and there's all these edge and ordering conditions that crop up, and there's all these emergent behaviors that systems in the large suffer from that individual pieces of it might not suffer from or um, individual, like the, the system under a smaller load or a smaller data set size might not suffer from. There's a lot of abuse you can do on small queries, which will bite you very, very badly in a larger data set. So there's got to be a way around this. You know, regular unit tests and integration tests are not cutting it, and manual tests are very expensive, very slow, and frankly, pretty tedious in a lot of cases. Um, so I think the way around this is generative testing or property-based testing. Now, I've given a talk on this kind of subject before. It was more of an intro to um, test.check. And the best thing about talking at the conj is I don't have to do the slide of, what's this closure thing and why do I care? Why are there parentheses everywhere? I'm confused and scared. Like, I get to skip that one. And I mean, I don't even have to do a huge intro to test.check because other people have done that. So we're kind of approaching this from a more shared knowledge base. And a lot of you might have actually used it um, in your own systems. But as a light overhead, in case you missed the earlier talks on it, um, uh, generative testing is, uh, instead of a regular unit test where you have hard-coded data, um, you use an API to describe the shape of the data you need. I need a vector of integers, or I need 
a sequence of hash maps which have these keys and values that are randomized strings, or I need a mix of integers and floats um, in, in a sequence, or kind of stuff kind of like that. Um, the benefits of this, and then you run multiple cases with the same, with the same uh, code and the same assertions. The benefits are you let the machine find the edge cases by just hammering the possibilities, which is a lot better. And it's a lot, um, you know, it, it can cover more test cases than you want to write. I've seen many a file, and I'm sure you have too, where it's the same code with different assertions all the way down, and nobody really wants to write that, to be completely honest. Um, and then it also provides a little feature called shrinking, where it remembers which ones failed and tries to shrink the results down to the minimal failing set, so that you end up with a failure case of two instead of a failure case of two items uh, in your data set instead of a failure case of ten in Invector, which makes life a lot, a lot easier. But in the interest of fairness, and because we're engineers and everything has a cost, and we're very well aware of that, there are some downsides. Um, the test duration is complicated. In regular unit tests, you have a fixed number of tests, a fixed amount of code you're running, and you decide what your target point is. I want to run my tests in five minutes. I want to run my tests in a minute, or whatever your particular thing might be. Um, with generative testing, because you're doing randomized stuff, there's a number that decides how many cases you're going to run, and that's just a little knob that you can get a hold of and turn it up and turn it down. So the temptation will always be, um, oh, this is taking too long. I'll just turn that knob down. And now you're not covering as much as you are. Or I need to cover more, so let's turn it up. And oh, and now it takes four hours. Crap. Like, so that, that makes the relationship with performance complicated. And if you don't know the data that you're putting in, you have, your assertions are more minimal. Um, they, that doesn't mean they're useless. In fact, they're actually the type of assertions you can find are incredibly important in certain scenarios. But you can't assert on the exact data that falls out. It either has to be a relationship from the input data or it has to be something that is always true, an invariant um, as well. Uh, so generally speaking, this is usually used for unit tests. And people will be like, OK, I get it. You know, I have a list of integers, and I, I shove it into this function, and I'm checking side effects, or I'm checking the results. So how, Integration tests, Selenium, API stuff are very do this, do that, check the result. How, how, the, no, these things don't work together. How are you going to do that? Well, it's simple. We're just going to represent what we're intending to do with data. We love data. Data is comfortable. Data is easy to read and a human can consume it. So, and, it, and hey, test or check can produce data. So, perfect. Let's, let's have a look at that. Um, but, before we really dive into the technical and nitty gritty of that, I, I think it's really important to understand why and how. Um, the, you know, I can stand up here and tell you exactly how to do generative testing with Selenium, and you might not care why. You know, you're like, why, why would I want to do this? This is going to be hard, and it is. It's not the easiest thing in the world. I need a, I need a motivation. So here's how we use this at Pivotal Tracker. Pivotal Tracker is a very, very large Ruby on Rails. I know, I know, boo. Um, and JavaScript application um, with a lot of mutable state. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> so the failure cases are interesting. Um, and the failure cases often really result in, I don't, like, I, I don't know what happened. Some, something bad has happened to me. So the first way we use this is um, reproducing test steps. Um, so I get a user report that says, I refreshed the browser and I got an error. I, I know you have something like this if you have a user-facing application. I started a story and now I'm getting an error message, or now I can't load the project. Great, you dig in the logs, you find the last 20 things they did, have fun. Like, you know, can, can you figure that out? I've, I've struggled. Like, it's not an easy thing to do, that's an art. Um, but if you can get your test to hammer your application, and you could somehow point in a direction where it can provoke that problem and catch that problem, which is a little bit more tricky, um, the shrinking will pull it down. Instead of getting 10 steps to reproduce it, I can get two steps. And we have used this successfully to debug um, user reported errors in production. Well, we didn't run this against production because, mm. but um, we, we use that against a user report. And you know, I modify my tests. I look at the report. I modify my tests. I start it, stand up, go get coffee, come back in 20 minutes, and it says, Here's the two things you do. You move this story from here to here, you start that one, and you refresh your browser. Bang. That's the user error. That's four hours of debugging. Gone. Right there. 
Um, and you're trading a blind human hunt for a blind code hunt. And a computer can do blind random things much better than a human being could ever do. Um, second way, known trouble spots. Concurrency, do you have problems with it? Probably, do you wanna find out exactly which ones? Yes, this is not a replacement for theoretical analysis, or not even theoretical analysis, but finding out what your model is, finding out how you fit in the CAP theorem, but if you think you've got problems, hammer it. You know, open two browsers and do two things in each browser and see if anything nasty falls out. Um, did you refactor a bit of code and go with a completely different architecture on your front end or on your back end? Hammer it, find out if anything bad happens. Find out if it's too slow, find out if it's has an edge case or if your front end depended on a bug on your back end, surprise. Um, or if your API does not play nice with, you know, or whatever, if you make a change, go ahead and use this kind of tool to, to attack it and find out if anything interesting happens. And then there's the blind luck factor. Eh, turn it on over lunch, go get lunch, come back. Oh look, it found something we had no idea existed and would have actually caused something, a problem for a user, but now we can cut that one off of the past and we don't have to deal with disappointing users and dealing with reports and all that stuff. In this case, I actually uh, uh, blundered into one time an API bug that caused all of our JavaScript clients to crash at once on the same project, which you might recognize as a very bad thing. Um, and it would have been provoked by our iOS application at some point in the future. But now we don't have to disappoint our users, and that is, um, they're the people who are using our product, so that, that really um, makes things better. And it's, it's a really, really wide regression that I'm attacking my entire application, so, you know, we'll find stuff. But in order to actually do things, you need tools. Engineers don't really just sit at a computer and think, although, well, depends on how well you're doing for the day, but we need tools. So what are we gonna need? Well, we're gonna need closure. That really shouldn't be much of a surprise. Um, we're gonna use test.check, it's been brought up before. Another secondary option is a library um, called DoubleCheck. It's a port of test.check by Chaz Emmerich, uh, who unfortunately could not be here today, um, and it used, it's, it's CLJX compatible. So if you need front end stuff as well, reach for that, and it will get you both JVM and JavaScript. Um, there's the excellent CLJ WebDriver library. It is a wrapper around Selenium that works, which is surprising to me as well. Um, we use JDBC. Uh, you need access to your database, whatever that might happen to be. So swap that out for whatever you need. Um, we're mostly using it for data setup and assertions. If you need really complicated queries, swap that out for something a little bit more punch. But be warned, if you write slow queries in here, you will be sad. So make sure that you're not doing anything too tricky. And CLJ HTTP. Um, if you need to do, we do API work for testing and for setup. So having a lightweight HTTP library is useful. If you don't have anything like that, you might not need that. Um, most important tool is test.check, which again has been covered before, is originally written by Reed Draper, among others, and it's a port of the famous Haskell Quick Check Library. Um, there are other alternatives in this space. Obviously this is a closure conference. I like closure, so I'm going with that one instead of Quick Check. There are Ruby equivalents, but um, they're not quite to the level of maturity of test.check at this point. And as a high level overview, um, Basically, the way you work with test.check as a user, under the hood, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but a macro creates a closure.test case for you. Um, you create all the book, it creates all the bookkeeping code to keep track of where all of the recorded failures and stuff like that. It runs the cases with all of the generated stuff that you asked for, um, records the actual failures and successes, and then shrinks the, those back down, running your code again, and reports to you, dear user, about whether it passed or failed, and if it failed, what is the first failing case and the smallest failing case it found. I, does everyone feel comfortable with that? Um, I know it's a lot to swallow in one go, and maybe some of you haven't used that in the past, but uh, it's, it's fairly important to understand this, but you have laptops. If you're really confused, we can go to the, you can go to the closure.test page. And here's an example test ripped straight from their readme.markdown, thank you, um, which, fairly simple. So you have def, def spec, which is a nice little macro. It's gonna create a closure.test case underneath this with the name, which is very long. Um, the number is the number of cases we're going to run. That is that knob, which you dial up and down. If you're not feeling comfortable, add another zero, you know. Do it over lunch or whatever, something, overnight. If you're feeling pretty confident, dial it down, save yourself a little bit of time. Then there's these, this for all macro, 
which binds variables for you to the generator. So in this case, we're going to bind the variable v. It's a standard let style binding um, uh, with a not empty vector of integers. It reads really nice left to right like that. And then we're going to assert that for each v, whatever that might happen to be, um, the minimum of v is equivalent to the first item of the sorted list of v, which I think makes intuitive sense. So I mean, this one of the problems with, with explaining these kinds of things is the examples are always kind of painfully simple because I could do a real case here, but you're going to have to understand the problem space at the same time. So while that does feel kind of simple, the, the power that gives you is truly massive um, when you start actually wiring that into your own application. So we're going to have a process because adding browsers doesn't exactly make the life easier um, or simpler or faster. So um, there's going to be a little bit more of a process to getting all this stuff going. It's not just as simple as a unit case. So at the very beginning, before running anything, using I, you could do it in, in multiple ways. I use a, a closure.test fixture once to do this. You need to do two things. I, you're going to need to get your database where you want it to be. I use fixture data done way before this runs, and I snapshot it into test memory. Um, this is for two reasons. One, so I can reuse that later for generators, and so I can reuse that later to get a consistent environment. Exactly what you need to pull up depends on what you're going to be breaking. And two, you're going to need some browsers. You don't want to start and stop browsers because it's not exactly the fastest thing in the world, and the performance disclaimer I gave earlier still applies. So set up your browser, log in, whatever you need to do. And then before each run, not each test, but each time you actually execute anything, you need to do these things. Get your database back to the exact same state it was before you ran. Um, this shrinking process needs a reliable environment in which to run. Your tests need to fail or succeed with the same input data every single time. Otherwise, a shrinking process is really more of a wild hunt down the tree, which doesn't really get you as much as you'd hope. You need to clear any caches and refresh the browsers. Um, state hides in a lot of places, as it turns out, and you need to go hunt it down and squish it. Otherwise, see previous warning. Um, generate the actions, um, so the, these representations of, of what the user is going to do. Um, now we're starting to hit standard closure or test.check um, code. Go ahead and do all of the things, um, and then assert, and hope that magic falls out from the wonder of test.check afterwards. So to cap that a little bit, we need generators, the ability to make them go do things, and we need assertions. So generators. Um, I actually really enjoyed the Hilbert talk earlier, um, or Herbert, sorry. Um, and that being said, what we're going to generate here are actually incredibly simple, but I would highly recommend looking into that as well. On a high level, um, generators just produce things. Um, there's simple ones like int and string, which just produce the simple types that, which they're named after and float and similar. And they're more complicated ones that consume another generator and modify in some way. So vector produces a vector of, you pass a generator and you get a vector of those things. So vector of int is vectors and ints, but a vector of more complicated generator is the results of that generator run again and again and again of varying lengths. Not empty just kind of throws away the empty case because it's often useless um, depending on what you're doing. Uh, hash map takes keys and generators and reduces returns hash maps where the keys are constants but the values are from said generators. Um, return is a, just a shortcut for um, I don't, I need, a, for various reasons it needs to be a generator but I really just want a constant or a value, so here's the little wrapper that makes this thing a value. And then elements in one of are very, very similar, but elements pulls a, a value out of a sequence, and one of pulls a generator out of a sequence and executes it. And we're going to use all of these um, in, in the coming slides. So just a quick little overview. There's really good codocs on the test.check page somewhere. Just Google it. There's a lot more than this, and they can get pretty, uh, complicated. And expressive is actually by the word I should use there. But So here's what an action looks like. This represents a user intent. Um, it's actually a fairly simple thing, um, but there's, some, there's a little bit of nuance to it. Almost everything in Pivotal Tracker has to do with a story. For those of you who haven't used it, if you, you can start a story, you can delete a story, comment, task, move them, what have you, change various bits of state about it in, in, in metadata. But 
everything centers around a story at some level or another, or stories. So we need to express that with a story. In this case, it's an ID of the story that we're going to do stuff to it. And then we need to know what we're intending to do with it, which is type. Um, you know, uh, in this case, it's drag drop, but there's various ones like add a comment, delete it, change state, change type, what have you. And then there's this via argument. Um, unfortunately, I found out um, just because you're a closurist doesn't mean you inherit Rich Hickey's naming ability, which is genuinely disappointing to me at this point. Um, via represents how we are going to do a thing to a story. So in Tracker, there's three ways you can get something done. The rich JavaScript front end, which is the main way people interact with it, and there's two different APIs. There is the stable API, and there is the soon to not be beta API, which will eventually replace the old stable API. So I find it useful to mix and match. What happens if I mix starting a story via Selenium and starting a story via API v5? Oh, that's interesting. If you don't want to do that or want to start simpler, you can drop that completely and add that later. It's actually not a terribly complicated thing to add in the future, and I, I'll cover exactly how that works, but that's why that's there. And then there's arguments. Um, arguments is whatever that action needs to do uh, its thing. So if you're adding a comment, I need a string. In this case, I'm intending to say that the user would like to drag the story 2198, whatever that one might be, to the story 2192. I have zero idea if that is actually a valid thing. I, I actually don't know what the story IDs are anymore. It's been a while. So, but that's, but that's just the, what the user intended to do. So a test to run it actually is shockingly simple. Um, here's a test. Once again, def spec. This is, this is a real test, indented for your, for your convenience, but it's an actual test that we use. Um, drag and drop, I want to do 10, could do 100, could do 10,000, whatever. And we're going to generate actions, which is a non-empty vector of hash maps, where type and via are hard-coded to be simply the, key, the namespace keywords, gen return. And story and args are various things that came out of at story IDs, which are the bits of state I pulled from the database and dropped in an atom in my before fixtures. This makes my life really easy, rather than having to generate action, generate stories, and then generate actions around it. Oopsies. I can start with I have all of these stories available to me, and they're already in various states because they're fixture data for this reason. I can just pick random ones and go do things with them, which makes my life a lot easier on the generation side as well. And I highly recommend doing a similar, similar tack if you wish to do that. And then we have this function called perform actions, which does, as I said before, all of the things. That's a little bit hand wavy for that section, and we'll, we'll dig into that in a minute. Um, but before we carry on to how we actually make a hash map you know, drive Selenium, there's a few things that you wouldn't expect off the top of your head. Um, action should be atomic. They should represent one complete action. Um, so, for example, and they should represent, a, a good way to think of this is, what would the user say they did? The user said they dragged from here to here. They didn't say, I click, then I move, and I let go. At least not in any user I've ever had. Um, and so, you should do something similar like that. So you should never, you should be able to, if you will, compose actions one after the other. You should not have to um, design them to be in a pair. If you, have to, if you have to generate two actions together to make it work, um, you're going to slowly drive yourselves nuts trying to make that generator work for you. I would not recommend it in the slightest. Um, I would ignore impossible sequences um, at this stage of things. There is a much better place to ignore um, sequences of actions which make no sense, and there are sequences which make no sense. If the sequence of actions is, I wish to delete a story and then I wish to start it, it's not going to work out for you, you know? But trying to eliminate that at generation time is a big ball of complexity, and you end up duplicating your application logic in your generators, which is not something you want to actually do. That's not the point of this exercise. Um, so we'll come back to that in a minute. And actions must completely describe everything you're intending to do. Um, do not shuffle them afterwards. Do not add extra data afterwards. Because what you're going to want to do is, hey, something really bad fell out of this particular run, and it said that these are the two actions that do it. You want to copy that into a unit test. You don't want to keep running the generative tests. You want to put that under a microscope, pin it down to the little examination table, and figure out what in the world is going on. And making sure that the actions up front completely describe that is the way to get that done. So 
hash maps, as great as they are, don't actually do things, as Zach covered. Like, you need actual code to, to go do things. So at the highest level, I would highly recommend multi-methods. I have a bunch of things that have hash maps, and I have a two keywords, which completely describe the intention of the type of action I'm intending to do, and then some arguments. So this is the multi-method, sans the documentation, for your ease, um, for driving that. Perform action, it takes the type, the via argument, project ID, story, and args. Um, and type and via are what describes which def method it goes to. So when I intend to create a new type of action in our system, and you, you will start with one and slowly work your way out wider and wider, I write a new def method, I write a new generator. Um, the generators often look kind of similar of, I need a new type of action and I need a new string, or I need a new other story ID. And as long as the new def method works, which is a bit of a leap of faith, um, everything, you're done, that's it. Okay, cool, add it to a test and away we go, which is frankly awesome and saves you a lot of trouble. And this prevents a big nasty con tree or if tree inside of your, your actually go do the things. Um, so I think that's, that's probably not a huge leap. I think everyone's like, yes, yes, Ashton, we know we'd have come up with that as well. Very impressive. Um, what's, what's more complicated is strategies. So an action represents, okay, I wish to go do something. I'll do the actual Selenium things to drag drop. What's not obvious is you need context around the execution of multiple actions. Um, so I call these things strategies. Um, there's multiple ways that you can actually execute a bunch of actions, multiple strategies, if you will. Um, and these allow for a different, slightly different modifications that you would not want to wire into the actions. Um, a really great example of that is in Tracker. We have two different strategies. Well, three, there's one, another one. But one is I have a sequence of actions of indeterminate length, and I wish to run them sequentially in one browser Maybe I'll fiddle with the timings of whether or not I want to just do it as fast as Selenium will let me go, or maybe I want to just wait until everything catches up. That's up to you. And the other one is, I don't have an indeterminate sequence of actions. I have two, and I have two browsers, and I'm going to fire both at the same time and see if everything works out. Um, this also provides a really consistent place to drop setup code. You don't want to forget setup code of all that stuff, so you drop it into the, the uh, um, strategy to get that done. And uh, yeah, basically, there's a lot of code that's always like, oh, I need to do a few things around each action. This makes the actions focus in on drag drop or whatever they need to do. Also, leave your assertions in your strategies, because your assertions depend on the context. Um, there is a um, message that pops up to, to paraphrase, basically says, we're terribly sorry, but your changes cannot be done. We are rolling them back. Have a nice day. Um, and, you know, in a parallel context, yeah, that's all right. You know, if I delete a story over here and start it over here, if this person gets that message, I am totally okay with that. If I am doing a bunch of things in one browser, I am not okay with that at all. That is catastrophic because somehow I've decided to send something to the server. The server's like, I, no, I, no, go back, try again. Uh, and that's a failure, and I want to know about that. So context matters when it comes to assertions. Um, and this also means, once again, you don't have to litter your code with assertions all over the place. You can leave it in one or two nice low places and tailor it exactly to your needs. And this eliminates deduplication. And when you add more, strat more uh, actions, it also means you're less likely to you know, screw it up and forget something. And then there's tolerance. Tolerance is an important thing in general, but in this particular context, I'm talking about actions. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. Your actions should be capable of handling states that are mm, sub-ideal. Um, so if I delete a story in one action and the next action is I want to start it, um, rather than trying to keep track of that state in your memory or trying to match all the stuff, just take a look and go, ah, I guess I can't do anything. Moving on. It's no op. In theory, this reduces the power of your um, tests a little bit by needing to run more cases. In practice, this hasn't found to be terribly painful. And also shrinking eliminates this. So if you have three actions, this one sets, I'll reverse it for you. This one starts up something. This one does a no op because of whatever reason. And then this one goes kaboom. It's going to shrink that down and drop that middle one. It will figure out that the middle one is not your friend and you don't need it. So making these things not blow up when they're not actually a failure is very useful. And besides, if it did blow up, it would be very, very annoying to get test.check telling you that, hey, the best way to break your application 
is to delete a story and then start it. Well, yes, I know, but let's go find something more interesting beyond that. And uh, don't be afraid to call JavaScript um, from Selenium. Uh, I used to try to keep track of what panels are open, because in Tracker you can open and close them, you can reorder them. It's very configurable, but if you're trying to do it programmatically, it's kind of a pain um, in the kindest of words. The, um, we have a little JavaScript helper, not helper, it's a, it's a kind of a semi-internal API that we use in other contexts. It's called enough that I know it's stable and I know where it is. I call it, and all it does is I say, I need this story. And it will find that story's panel, it will open up that story's panel, it will scroll that panel into view, and it will scroll that story into view, and it will blink it. Yes, that is not how a user interacts with our product, but neither is doing 10 things in a second. So a little bit of compromise is, is necessary here, and this means my tests don't fail for stupid reasons. You probably have something similar, don't hesitate to call it. You're hunting for more serious bugs than, than I don't know how to duplicate my state into a second application. But actions alone don't do things. We, well, they do things, but they don't do anything useful for you. We need assertions. As I mentioned earlier, assertions in a generative context get a little tricky. Um, you can't assert specific bits of text because you just simply don't know. You don't know what you've done to your application, unless if you're gonna go and analyze your actions, which it seems like a pretty bad idea to me. I've never actually bothered to try. Um, but the type of assertions you can get are still pretty good because the, the degenerate cases for large, especially rich applications and web applications in general are fairly easy to notice if you've got the right APIs. Um, and you need to be able to, they need to be things that are always true. This is what the word invariant means, if you haven't heard that before. Um, so the assertions we use, uh, well, we're on localhost and localhost is reliable, I hope. Um, the, and it's fairly fast, so if all of our changes haven't synchronized to all the browsers open in 10 seconds, uh, something truly horrible has happened, and I would like to know why this thing has happened. Um, the client and the server and the client and the other client, I typically have two browsers open, should all agree about the state of the world. Um, I don't really care if driving from here to here is okay, but if I drive from here to here and suddenly this box thinks the store orders ABC and that box thinks it's ACB, something really, really bad has happened and I would like to know about that. So that's also where JDBC comes in. At the end of every test, I go to the JavaScript client and say, give me your state. I would, the important bits in our case because we do not have the joy of having the same data model across both sides, so I can't just do as flat equality, which is unfortunate, but it's what it is. Um, so I just go to the, the, the the JavaScript and say, I want the simple model of your state. I need the important bits. And I go to JDBC and I say, what is your state? I want to know what the database thinks everything is. And I compare them. You know, again, not realistic, but it is fast and it is reliable, so it's useful. Um, presence of error alerts and dialogues. We catch certain errors in, in core reports, parts of our code on the JavaScript side, and if, they, if we catch an error there, we commonly display a little box. The user says, I'm terribly sorry, something terrible has happened please click this button to reload tracker, that blows away all the caches in the hope that that resolves the issue and reloads them. That pops up, failure. I need to know about it and I need to know why. If an alert pops up, failure. If the browser just suddenly goes away or the server goes away, failure. I need to know about all of these things. So, that kind of stuff. And a kind word on performance about assertions because I learned the hard way. Um, assertions can be slower than actions in some cases. Um, and generative tests, as I mentioned before, are a little weird on the performance thing. So if you have slower assertions, you're going to severely hamstring the amount of work you can get done with this, and the point is to really hammer it. So with all of that out of the way, um, Glenn Vandenberg gave me the advice that I should just simply say, watch this. So with some luck, we are going to try to watch something. We'll see. The setup time is um, non-trivial because you've got closure setup time and you've got JVM setup time and you've got Selenium trying to stand up. Um, so I'm just gonna stand here and keep talking while this process that you actually can't see runs. Sorry about that. So at this point, we pulled the database state. We've logged in. You missed that because I was trying to cross the browsers. And 
I don't know why selenium always does that. It happens to me on Capybara too. It's very, very obnoxious. Unfortunately, uh, this laptop does not have the punch of our standard development machines. So this speed is nowhere close representative of the performance that we managed to get through on a fully maxed out iMac 27 inch as compared to a middling 13 inch MacBook Pro. Oh crap, I don't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> we have a new bug, it's great. Um, the, our application doesn't load without Wi-Fi even on localhost. No worries, I have a backup. Um, the wonderful Karen Meyer gave a talk a couple years ago where she did something involving Wi-Fi in a crowded room full of laptops and um, she, was, she recorded a, a, a video in advance and I have decided to wholesale copy that. So I recorded a video and just for this exact reason. Because the gods of Wi-Fi and live demos do not like me today. So while that's warming up, and I think I've got a few minutes left, um, and you know, this is just to watch the browser go and blink. It's not, you're not gonna see anything like truly mind blowing, but just to see how it goes. Uh, I think I have a few minutes and yeah, I gotta think a minute or two. Any questions real quick? So the question was, are all of the, um, these parts I mentioned, are they part of the framework or are, um, am I plugging them in? And the answer is I'm plugging them in. Um, I have considered writing, uh, I might write example code, uh, the copyright gets a little complicated in that area and this depends on running um, Pivotal Tracker on your local instance, which is something you cannot do and only I can do. And so I, I wrote it all myself and, and it's, it's, this, it's the classic closure thing of I have some parts and I wire them together kind of thing. And a lot of, the reason why I haven't gone beyond that is I'm fairly convinced that a lot of the stuff I do is specific to Tracker and wouldn't really process over only the general ideas, which is why I'm here and not releasing a library in, in particular, so. But I'd be very, very pleased if we could generalize more. I really hope. Huh. Okay. Anyone else? So, and that might be very hard to do, obviously. Um, but is there any work on maybe generating like qualitative um, like constraints on what you expect back? Or, you know, is there something other than the sales? You know? So there, the question was, um, is there a way to generate the expected result? Um, and that might be a little tricky, but it, it, that depends on what you're doing. It really depends on what you're doing. In a lot of unit ca test cases, um, I have an input and I can transform that using a second pa code path to the expected output. So let's say I'm rewriting a slow code, piece of code into a faster piece of code. That is totally an option. Um, in the case of what I'm describing here, and so in the, in the unit test case, that is possible depending on what you're trying to do. What I'm describing here as a larger whole application, whole system, let's abuse things way of doing it, um, you would have to duplicate application states into your tests, which is probably not something you want to do, so. In the middle? Uh, yeah, um, without diving uh, too far into things I probably should not share on, on video, um, we found a couple of JavaScript uh, errors in some code we had refreshing. We found a couple of API bugs that caused uh, uh, negligent, or, or um, not negligent, but uh, um, suboptimal things to be passed to JavaScript clients, which caused them to barf and fall over. We found a four-year-old SQL bug. We have a, a big SQL query which um, massages the database back into where you would want it to be after a, an occasional failure. And that had a, a bug in it which caused it to cycle. We wrote some stuff, uh, generative tests, in one day to find the minimal ca failing case with that to pin that down correctly. Um, what else? I found hints of a very, very rare concurrent condition that happens occasionally that has been reported about twice over the past five or six years, and I found a unit test case that will, will, will provoke it about 30% of the time. So, <laughs> concurrency's hard. I, I, I can't help you there completely. You're gonna have to talk to Kyle Kingsbury or somebody similar. Like, that's not, 
that's not exactly my, my strong suit. But so that's, and the majority of these things were, it took a couple of days to get some of the stuff going. Some of these things are one-off writes, like the SQL thing, but majority of these things are sub one day fixes and finds. Some of them are sub one hour. So the one where we had a person who had a bug on refresh, I modified it and ran it and found it in sub 40, I think it was about 30, 20 minutes off the top of my head. I, I didn't actually record it, I went and got coffee. But um, so, yeah, it, there's definitely a lot, of, a lot of cases where we've done that. And it, we actually have not sunk a huge amount of time into this. I think as far as pair days, um, maybe eight or nine, maybe a few more. Um, I, I haven't actually been writing it down, so I can't recall off the top of my head, but um, not a ton of work. And I, I am wholeheartedly convinced that um, we could do more, and I'm really interested in things like web driver logic that would allow for me to make more strong assertions about it um, that would fit my model more correctly if I could just make it faster. <laughs> so, the, yeah, I think, does, I, does I explain it? How are we doing on time, am I done? Okay, um, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Do you do anything to try to um, make the order of operations in those two browsers? Yes, that is, a, that is an excellent question. The question was, uh, when I'm doing two browsers, do I do anything to control the order of execution between the two? Um, Pivotal Tracker is using a pinging architecture, not a um, socket or SSE architecture, which makes our life a little easier. There is code I can get a hold of from the Selenium driver, so one of the things I can do is I can go to both browsers and say, ping now. And that means they both go and it's 12 seconds until the next ping happens. I can go to this one and trigger it. And that means that one's now up to date. That command is gone. This one is behind, but it's stuck behind until the next ping happens. So if I trigger an event here, it's event, this event will come in, it will, read, it will roll back, and it will execute them in, or, in a specific order. So yes, I, the, and that is unique to how we do network stuff. And the moment we switch to, to um, streaming, I am screwed and have got to figure it out. Um, it, you'd have to, you're gonna have to call your application directly and disconnect or something. Or you just have to drop them both and hope for the best. I mean, y you know, a little bit of randomness never killed anyone, right? So. One more and I think we're, yep. Um, stale element exception represents quite a large number of false negatives or positives. I don't know which way that one goes. Um, I just kind of do that try catch and ignore those. Uh, I've never found a way to fix that. Um, usually, I found that the, the false hit ratio is slowly falling. Um, when I first started out, lots, um, but over the couple of days, I finally learned the edge cases where I could kind of pull those things out, and the the, the hits are actually generally either. Um, Selenium has decided it does not like me today and would kindly like to wedge itself and go away. That happens and I don't know how to make that go away. Um, and then so a lot of times it's just simply, uh, but now it's actually an increasingly large number of actual failures. If it, and I guess the easiest way to answer that is when it actually barfs up a failure, I pay very close attention because I expect that to be legitimate more than I expect that to be non-legitimate. So. So I think I'm out of time, but thank you very much for coming and watching me, and you enjoyed the content. <laughs>